Okay, here's fascinating. Here's some more of you viewers, and this is what you're saying, concerning whether or not Christianity and Islam have the same problem when it comes to manuscript, when it comes to revelation. Uh, here's one by Rug49, and he says this, The way that Christianity and Islam spread is more important than the existence of any original manuscripts. Neither religion, that's both Islam and Christianity, would exist today if it had not been embraced by a powerful ruler and propagated by the rulers who succeeded them. And he's putting both Christianity and Islam in the same bag. Morton Simon said, actually answers this. I love it. Thanks, Morton, for, uh, because you respond to this uh, in, in, uh, right after he says this. He says, oh, the irony. Islam spread by the tip of the sword. Even Muhammad himself could not get things going in Mecca. By peaceful means, that is. He had to move to Medina and start writing according to your traditions. Christianity cannot boast of military means, but still spread in the Roman Empire. Granted, it became much more popular after Constantine converted, but it was substantial before that. In fact, Constantine would never have converted if it wasn't. So, a comparison between Islam and Christianity will show a very important difference. They are really two different species, he says. Islam would be forgotten unless backed by violence and oppression. Christianity rests on historical facts, as I and millions of Christians see them. Jesus was crucified and resurrected. It does not rely on political props or propagation. So, but let me look. There are four things I want to really confront or uh, that try to challenge from what Rug 49 is saying. Thanks for Rug for doing that, and I think it's great that you come up with these four areas. Let me just hit first of all this idea that. Uh, neither religion would exist today if it had not been embraced by a powerful ruler and propagated by rulers. The idea that both Christianity and Islam w would not exist had there not been a someone from on top pushing it from above. And I would suggest that what you're doing is you're taking the history of Islam as the traditions tell us, and you're, which it was started from above, it was started by caliphs, it was started by Muhammad who became a caliph, and Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali, according to traditions, I don't believe that, that, but nonetheless, it was started by caliphs because we do know that when Islam, even historically speaking, if you look and see how Islam finally was fomented, it was begun by Abdul Malik in in uh, 692, and then of course it really took its on its own by the Abbasid Caliphate. So it was the Caliph, it was the ruler. It, whether you take the historical route or whether you take the Islamic traditional route, either way, both of those paradigms start from the premise that Islam was created by rulers and maintained by rulers and enlarged the uh, by rulers, Caliphs in the case of Islam. Now what Rug 49 is saying is, ah, the same thing must have existed for Christianity, and you haven't done your history lessons. Go look and see. Christianity did not begin, nor was it started, nor was it fomented by any rulers. In fact, Christianity for the first 300 years was as poor as you could get, was as persecuted as you could get, by virtue of the fact that they were poor and they were persecuted and were not powerful. They were destitute. And that's why Christianity is completely different than Islam. Do not compare the two. We do not have the same beginnings. For 300 years, we had no power. For 300 years, we were persecuted. And for 300 years, we tended to be poor. It was only when Constantine, who was emperor, then was converted uh, to Christianity, that then after that, once he became, uh, once he brought Christianity and made it. He didn't himself make it the national religion, but soon after it was made the national religion. Only then did suddenly Christianity come with power. And that's where the problems began for Christianity. Because Christianity, if you look at what Jesus said, was never intended to work from power. It was always intended to work from weakness. We were not, we are not to be the state and the church are not to come together. Christ said very clearly, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. And we give to God what belongs to him. And we do not go to Caesar to eradicate or try to uh, eradicate all our problems. We always go back to God. And that's why for the first 300 years, we were persecuted. We were under the sword. We never used the sword. The sword was always used against us. What was fascinating, according to the latest statistics, uh, historical findings, when Christ died and when the church began, 
is certainly at the time of the book of Acts, right after Christ's death and resurrection, and then his ascension up to heaven. Historians believe that there were maybe around 500, possibly as many as 2,000 Christians at that time, immediately after Christ's death. Uh, we, don't, we can't know for sure, but it's estimated about 2,000. By the 4th century, that means within 300 years of Christ's death, the church had grown from that 500 to 2,000 up to 30 million. Up to 30 million. So the growth of Christianity had nothing to do with power, had nothing to do with the sword, had nothing to do with any kings or emperors that controlled it. The greatest growth in the history of Christianity in the last 2,000 years, if you look and see from 500 to 30 million, was under persecution. So don't confuse the two. They're not alike at all. Mm -hmm.